Before we delve into specifics about the cases that have been mentioned and the governor announced last night, I'd like to speak to the folks at home watching on TV because I feel like as part of the conversation that we've been having, we've been talking a lot about numbers, we've been talking a lot about viruses and all those kinds of things, but we haven't really created space to talk about and address the fears and anxiety that folks have. So I want to place this here and let folks at home know that we understand that, we take that in, we don't dismiss that, and we factor that into the decisions we make in terms of the next steps that we need to take. Um, so we don't only just think about a clinical perspective or an epidemiologic perspective, we also think about the anxiety that it brings in terms of something that's new that we've never seen before. We also recognize that there are a host of other fears and concerns as well related to how I access healthcare and, and who is a trusted source of information, um, particularly in this age where there are all sorts of information that can be gathered from social media, so on and so forth. So we want you to understand that we are working hard. The frontline staff who is executing a lot of the plans that we're discussing and talking about are dedicated, they're brilliant, they're experienced, and they're working hard to make sure that we deliver the information to you in a timely manner, making sure that it's accurate, it's comprehensive, and it addresses the concerns that you have. So as best as you can to the 1.1, 1.2 million residents of Montgomery County, I want you to feel that you can trust us and understand what we're providing you as transparent information uh, to address your concerns and trust the, the efforts of those who are on the front lines executing uh, their jobs on a daily basis. Now, as has been mentioned, we train for this, we practice, we prepare for this, we have exercises, but there's never anything with, but the adrenaline that comes when you have the reality of it. And we recognize that adrenaline does also bring up a lot of questions and concerns. Uh, and I want to highlight the numerous resources that we have, including the county website, as well as the state website and the CDC website that provide evidence-based factual information to guide and address a lot of the potential concerns that you have. I know this is going to be tricky because again, we're going to throw out a lot of different terms. So before we delve into that, I wanna explain a couple of those to make sure you get an understanding of, of the different terminology. Now the governor's office declared a state of emergency. What does that mean? Does it mean panic and so on and so forth? And in actuality, we at our, our command center in the public health emergency preparedness services team are moving to an active status. So what does that all mean? Does that mean you know we're, we're going to see an uptick in cases right away? So when we talk about declaration of emergency, those terms are most influential when helping activate staff. So making sure we have adequate staff to staff all of our centers on a 24 seven basis. So when you're calling in our call centers, making sure there's someone there who's trained and knowledgeable to be able to give you the right answer. We recognize that we have some work and are working on addressing the ability to make sure all of those capabilities are accessible by language, different languages um, to address those concerns. So we're working on that and making sure that that is available and up and running fully. Uh, and so that has to do, when talking about emergency, that has to do with mobilizing staff, being able to mobilize funds to be able to pay for all of these different resources. So that's what that term is focused on. And when I talk about us moving to active status, it has to do with we're staffing up to be able to make sure that we are able to meet the needs of the community and address your concerns and hopefully take a more proactive stance in terms of preventing potential cases, new cases uh, in the future. So a couple other terms I want to throw out is we're going to talk about incubation periods. So when you've, you've heard it related to COVID-19, we're not talking about coronavirus anymore. We're talking about the specific name of the illness, COVID-19, because as some of you know, coronavirus refers to a whole family of different viruses, including the common cold. And so at, within that, there's a full spectrum of, of severity of illness within this family. So as it specifically rates to, relates to COVID-19, we have seen COVID-19 hit a lot of different countries and the number of countries affected are increasing and we're getting updates on a daily basis. And we've seen a number of cases pop up in the United States. When we've seen those cases, there are some differences within that. And I wanna make sure that everybody understands. There's differences in terms of how they're transmitted. So as the cases are here in Montgomery County, which I'll talk about in a few seconds, those three cases are travel related. 
They're related to individuals who travel to an area where they were exposed to COVID-19 and came home infected with the virus. That's different from community transmitted, which we have seen in the most recent cases in Washington and Northern California. Community transmission means that an individual who had no travel history or didn't have any significant risk based upon being exposed to someone else with a significant travel history got sick and got the illness in some way, shape, or form. And that's probably our most concerning level of transmission because we don't have an active source that we can point to that caused those cases. I want to be clear, as best as we know today, based upon the clinical data and the epidemiologic data that we have available, we don't have any cases of community transmission within our community. Everybody clear on that? As of today, as best as we know, we don't have any evidence of community transmitted cases of COVID-19. Now we do have three new cases that are tied to travel related um, exposures. Now the press conference, the governor's press conference last night, Deputy Secretary Phillips laid out a lot of those criteria and those individual cases. I want you to know that the state has been working on doing contact tracing. And by contact tracing, I mean literally going through and checking contact. So if I was exposed on a certain date, tracking all of the different places that I've been, all of the different venues I have accessed, and any of the, and trying to get a sense of any individuals who I've come into contact with during that time period before I may have quarantined myself or isolated myself. And so the state has been actively working on that since they heard about these cases. And we have joined in that effort helping a system in terms of helping complete that investigation. There is no set timeline with when, within which that will be completed other than to say it is being done expeditiously. And as part of that, other contacts may be deemed high risk and require testing and follow up. And there is the potential that we may see other cases tied to these index cases within our jurisdiction. But what I want to also emphasize that Deputy Secretary Phillips mentioned is that all of these cases are doing well clinically. They're all doing well clinically. Everybody get that? They're all doing well clinically, okay? And so that suggests that the severity of the illness that even if it's here, remains in a mild to moderate category. And for some of you who may have been at our briefing on Tuesday, we know some of the information has changed because the world is rapidly changing around us as it relates to COVID-19. We talked about how there's some populations who are predisposed to having more adverse outcomes than others. We recognize that individuals who have a host of chronic conditions or acute health conditions that may predispose them to poor health status our elderly population and individuals who have concerns about their immune systems may be more susceptible to developing a more severe form of the illness. But again, I want to repeat what I said a couple of phrases ago. The three cases involved here are doing well clinically and for the most part, have, uh, their symptoms have abated. They are all under isolation. They are not being exposed to the community right now. And again, emphasizing the state as well as in partnership with the local health department are completing the necessary contact uh, investigation to find out if there are others who are at risk of exposure. So those are the cases that were mentioned last night. Uh, we have been in close communication with the state uh, and talking back and forth and gaining more information. At this time, based upon the total and some of the information we have available, including clinical data, epidemiologic data, as well as any other anecdotal data that's relevant to the situation, we are not recommending any large-scale closure of any of our government buildings, facilities, including schools. What we are recommending to folks, as has been pointed out by the county executive and council president Katz, is to continue to do the precautions that we have listed before. Washing your hands thoroughly, washing surfaces. If you are symptomatic, staying home from school or staying home from work. One other thing that came up in a meeting this morning that I want to highlight, and I'm very thankful that was part of the discussion, is this notion of travel. So, 
travel histories, travel itineraries are being updated on a daily basis. We see countries added to the list from the federal perspective in terms who's level four, level three, level two, level one. What that means is the government has determined that based upon the information they have, the number of cases and the level of, of disease in those particular areas, those places are being designated high risk, low risk, medium risk. And those advisories are what are used to advise you, should you be going to any of those destinations, such as in several weeks over the spring break period. So while there are no, there are very limited and few travel uh, bans to certain places, be mindful of that. And it would be a good idea to look into those travel warnings for international places, but also be mindful on a domestic level as well. There is no current guidance, and we haven't put out any guidance from a jurisdiction perspective. Uh, we're thinking about that and looking into that in terms of saying you shouldn't go to this place or that place. But it would be mindful and important to start thinking through that as you make your travel plans or think about that over the next several weeks. So stay tuned for those, those types of announcements. So no large global recommendations beyond that. Again, all of this is subject to change. And the last thing that I would ask for the public at home, in addition to trusting us and, and hopefully taking our sense of calm and hopefully addressing some of your, your anxious um, energy, is to be patient in some situations. Again, our task is to get information out as quickly as possible, but our task is also to make sure that information is accurate, it is comprehensive, it is thoughtful, it is disseminated in a way that is easily understandable, and that doesn't always happen right away. And so I hope as best as I can convey, the information that we are putting out has gone through that process, has been vetted, and we have made sure it's accurate, it's factual, and it's potentially addressing the, the concerns that you have. So I think that's a summary of the, the, the cases uh, and a summary of where we are in terms of investigating those cases, as well as larger options and actions that we'll take. Again, just to remind you that we are nimble and flexible as best as we can, and our, those recommendations are subject to change dependent upon the information that we gather from the investigations. Thank you.